Hey friends, welcome back to Studies in Counseling. We're exploring the most uh, interesting, engaging questions in the field, and I am so fortunate today. I'm here with my new friends, Dr. Duenas and Dr. Perkins. Uh, how are y'all today? Great. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And we have a question we like to start with, which is about being absorbed. And so the question is just about what has been absorbing uh, both of you re recently, uh, what's been on, on your mind, whether it's in counseling or just in life, um, like what's most alive and present for, for you. Maybe we can start with Dr. Duenius and, and go to Dr. Perkins. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, definitely preparing for the or the podcast today. So yeah. I feel like my, yeah, some of the work we're doing is definitely alive and present for me at the moment. Um, thinking about ways to integrate makerspace, and we can talk about what that is, for example, many might not know what a makerspace is, um, as a creative approach in counseling. Um, so if I even take a step back from that, I think counseling in the 21st century is broad, mm. um, bringing in some of the sort of marvels and technology and in advancements that we've made, thinking about AI, VR, things mm. that are coming down the line and definitely are here to stay in our culture, um, sort of in conjunction with right, some mental health challenges globally that we're also looking at. So things like addiction epidemic, youth mental health crisis, mm. um, global pandemic, um, and so just this, what is it to be a counselor today in the 21st century? We have the, these technological marvels. We're sort of starting to wrap our minds around, or many have already made a lot of progress with. Um, and then this also these global mental health challenges that are, we're mm. as humans working through, but also then with our clients as well. Um, and so and I'll let Dr. Perkins go in a minute, yeah. um, but just sort of thinking about yeah, how can we integrate some of this? What's changing? I always think of Sam Gladding had a in an article talked about how it's important to evolve mm. as a profession to stay relevant. And so how can we sort of bring some of these pieces in um, and then finding makerspace and really understanding makerspace ideology, how it's evolved as well. Makerspace has evolved in the last 10 years and thinking about how it can really be used um, to bring some of these pieces together in the counseling room is exciting. So I think that's I'll stop. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fast. Yeah. Okay. Talk so, um, so just upfront, I am not a counselor. <laughs> so, but I, um, my background is in library science, instructional technology, and art education, and so that's what I've studied academically. And um, my professional lens is very much from still from the librarian perspective, and that's coalition building, community building, interdisciplinary. Um, approaches to all sorts of different questions that community members might have, and then supporting other professionals in my community to use the resources and make connections and collaborations. And um, so that's the perspective that I come from, and that's why I'm so excited about makerspaces, because yeah. I feel like they are a, when they're positioned in places like libraries or community centers, they offer access to um, technologies and professionals and happy amateurs who are interested in all kinds of different things and open those doors to different experiences and perspectives and knowledge that people can, can then put together in new ways, which is exactly kind of how this whole collaboration <laughs> happened. Um, and so, you know, that that's what's really engaging me in terms of like the work that I do and the research that I do is, um, you know, finding ways to break down sort of those silos that people put up around um, you know, different expertise and really showing how we should really be working interdisciplinarily. Wow. Yeah. I want to kind of make some, first of all, thank you both for sharing what's in <laughs> you and absorbing you right now. It's very fascinating. And starting with what you're sharing, Dr. Duane, is, um, it's so counseling, right? Your approach to technology, because, you know, counseling, this is a generalization, but we tend to try to be strength-based and we, uh, look, look to enhance strengths and, Obviously, we know with technology, you know, there's some ills, social media, um, disembodiment, um, you know, social isolation and distancing from the pandemic and from maybe something like social media. And now we've got like AI and virtual reality, many exciting things. And so we can diagnose and there's many di documentaries and studies diagnosing some of the challenges with that. 
And you're looking at some of the strengths, like how can we leverage this technology and utilize it to address address some of the the, the problems going on uh, right now. And then obviously, if we want to know our clients, if we're working with millennials and Gen, Gen Z, especially like having some level of knowledge about these, it's just going to be important from an empath empathetic perspective. I'm just for, 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 that's my idea of it and my reflection of what you're saying. And then uh, Dr. Perkins, fascinating your work. First of all, thank you for engaging with our field and being being willing to uh, mm -hmm. come into our field and offer us some of your wisdom and knock down those silos. It's so valuable. Um, I know just from my experience doing drug and alcohol counseling, libraries are essential partners for us, um, free spaces and just places people can go. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hadn't even put that connection together before this interview, but uh, I'm thinking of this term that I got from social work called boundary spanning like being willing to cross professional identities and and integrate wisdom and it's so cool that y'all are doing that it makes a lot of sense like physically having maker spaces um in um in libraries and how can we as a counseling profession uh in, interact with that and, and learn um so that's just kind of a reflection no question there but i'm curious if anything's lighting up from that or if i mis misunderstood anything no oh, good i was just thinking you know i so <laughs> from I um a lot of what you said sort of sparked a few different things, but um I think with the global challenges piece of it, there's a multifaceted approach to healing, right? And to yes. helping and to supporting. And so some of that is that individual counseling work. Some of it is community-based mm -hmm. work. Um, so like you said, having spaces that are there that are for health and wellness um through at makerspace possibly right in those libraries museum like when i think of so let me back up to makerspace because i don't even know if we really defined what a makerspace yeah, what's makerspace or the mm -hmm. ideology of a makerspace and then dr perkins please interrupt me or um i'm <laughs> uh misspeaking um but so the idea started back in the early 2000s because it was cost prohibitive, like to have access to some of these 3D printers, laser engravers, um, that many people didn't have the ability to utilize these technologies or learn from them because they were so expensive that community spaces started being built around the idea of do it yourself, this idea of coming back to doing things with our hands, this do it mm. yourself or do it with others, which is a term I learned from uh, Roseanne. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so bringing people together in a collaborative space to learn together from each other and their shared expertise, often free spaces like libraries, um, maker spaces have now popped up in schools, They're, but they have lots of different names like fab labs, or my kids take a quest class in school, and that's the science, technology, engineering, and math, and it has the 3D printers and um, all different supplies in those spaces. And in the last two decades, we've really seen that technology, um, universities spaces have maker spaces, um, but we've seen that technology really change and become for the common crafter, more affordable um, and accessible to everybody in a different way, or let's say everybody, because certainly there is still a bar of purchase, mm. but my son asked last holiday season for a 3D printer wow. and it cost less than his video game device, right? So <laughs> to be able to offer that to him, um, that it's more practical now that that it, it's not the thousands of dollars it once was mm -hmm. to, to have these types of things in your home or office space. And then a makerspace, because the idea is coming together to collaborate and create, also includes the expressive arts. Like that's a part of the space, like all of the art that's not reinventing the wheel. We have had that in our profession for a long time, um, but that including the STEM, STEAM, right? The science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, because when we talk about expressive arts, often these other technologies are not brought into, like 3D printing isn't a part of what we think of as the expressive arts but absolutely people are expressing themselves that way. And the, what the, just, I'm gonna get real excited, but the mm -hmm. thought around thinking about how we can use metaphor or, and have, I had um, in the study we did with interns who we used the makerspace here at Kutztown. Um, and we had a student who went, had one of his clients draw himself as a, um, a superhero, and then he Aww. printed it on the 3D printer for him. And so wow. he had this takeaway of that he created of himself that, so just, I mean, the applications of it, in my mind, are, you know, really unlimited. Yeah. Um, 
And so we're working on a book together now and we're writing about some of that, but bringing those pieces in to what, what we already have been doing in counseling, but just allowing some of these other technologies in. And after COVID, they're being used. I mean, people are expressing themselves in videos, TikToks, um, editing software. It's so accessible now. 3D printing, laser engraving. I'm trying to think of all the ways that we've sort of highlighted this. Creating mindfulness, you know, creating a box and for an individual, like metaphorically to hold space for them or to hold on to something. We can actually create that with them, you know, and have them design it or yeah, so I'll, I'll stop again, but uh, I'll just keep going. Yeah. Well, and I think you're also seeing, um, you know, alongside all of the technology tools, um, you're also like, I, I have so many students who knit in my classes now, and that is so different from 10, 15 years ago, even. Um, and it's something tactile that they're doing with their hands. It helps them focus. And, um, you know, while, while we're talking, while we're, while we're lecturing, while we're working on things, mm -hmm to have that in their hands. Um, and there's this dialogue that we're having about, you know, fast fashion and, you know, the the ways that you know, we've, we've driven towards consumerism in our clothing, right? Yeah. And as a way to push back, a lot of what I'm seeing with at least my undergrads is that they're, they're thrifting and they're creating their own clothes and they're knitting and they're crocheting and they come in wearing the things that they crocheted and knit it for each other. <laughs> And um, and I think that's really cool on a number of levels, but it's also alongside this technology that's happening, there's this re-embracing, I think, um, especially in some of the, our, our younger people, um, the idea of making things for themselves um, and being more thrifty and more um, environmentally conscious, um, reusing and repurposing things. And that lends itself perfectly as well to the makerspace movement. So it's this wonderful blending of the old and the new around this idea that humans have always been driven to make things with their hands, right? Make things with their minds, make things <laughs> however they can make them. Um, and um, that's just, just seems to be something that all cultures and all societies share is this, this want to make things, so. Yeah, and maker makerspace as a movement is mm -hmm. not new in a lot of other fields. It's new, I think, in our, our field, the idea of incorporating this maker ideology, um, but it's a global, globally known, you know, President Obama had a Makers of Nation movement. Mm. Um, where he's, there's a whole website, you know, on connecting people to other makers and resources that, yeah, being able to take what's internal and express it through creating and making um, in different ways. Yeah. So it's fascinating. And I just want to do a quick process reflection before digging into that, which I feel like both of you have, uh, we're just meeting, but this kind of innovative creative spirit, because even in this podcast, uh, we're innovating. This is our first three person like panel interview that we've done. And so we're like feeling out the dynamics of whose turn is it to talk and uh, mm -hmm. who's talking too much, you know, and what's, there's really no, we don't have a model for that. So it's like dynamic, but also tricky. Um, and I feel like we, I'm curious what y'all, your thought, your, both of your thoughts are on this, because I imagine this is very exciting and I'm ready to incorporate this into my research and work. I'm already fired up about it after reading your stuff. Um, but I do think that in counseling, um, it's new and maybe some of the reason is not because we're not innovative, but there are like unique challenges in counseling um, with incorporating uh, uh, makerspaces. And the two I thought of, and I think they come up in your research a little bit, but also tell me what I'm missing here with maybe challenges or obstacles um, to incorporating this. We've talked about some of the benefits, benefit being community, um, exp you know, connecting with deep de drives and desires we have to create. Um, and yeah, just the democ democratizing expression and creation is just so beautiful. The challenges I thought of were one, you know, eth ethically in counseling, we worry about privacy. And so this is obviously going to be in the modality of groups, probably, maybe not, maybe we could do individual stuff, but if it's in a traditional makerspace, like it's going to be in the open. Um, so we've got like uh, maybe the modality of groups, which is kind of like what we're doing here, which is fun. I was thinking about it. And then also like stigma, right? Like mental health stigma, like this idea of creating myself and expressing myself as someone addicted to drugs or someone with borderline personality disorder who's dealing with psychosis. Um, like expressing that truth, I feel like the therapeutic benefits 
would be immense. But then there's also this hesitation of like, should I be showing myself, you know, expressing and um, democratizing expression kind of has that risk of being seen maybe and being judged. Um, so I, I'm curious if you could riff off of uh, mm -hmm. fix and privacy and then stigma and any other uh, things you're addressing in your research around obstacles and um, maybe, and also how this relates to how library science, because I know anonymity and privacy is a huge concern in that field as well. Um, so curious what we can learn from library science as well. So uh, either either direction. Uh, I love or, it. Thank you for bringing yeah. those up. Yeah. yeah. Is it okay if I... Yeah, go for it. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, I think we should... I went back for Makerspace, but I Makerspace can be in a set space, but could also be in a counseling office. Okay. I mean, a Makerspace can be in your desk drawer Mm. The spirit, that ideology piece of it is the spirit of creating um, and making and sort of empowering individuals and sort of creative problem solving, but empowering them to create and then work through what they're experiencing when they're doing that. That could be, you know, no tech, low tech, high tech, but that with the affordability of makerspace technology, more, more so, I mean, not say, but more so affordable, um, it's the same as getting into yeah, if you're buying board games for play therapy or if you're buying figurines for sand tray, that it's right. something that absolutely can be done in a counseling office. Um, in the same way that some counseling offices have whole play therapy rooms dedicated with grants, probably book grants for picking up some of these pieces for creating can be done, which which then would uphold that confidentiality piece and that concern surrounding that. Mm -hmm. I think in a public space, it's definitely going to be part of that informed consent piece that we'd want to make sure we're doing all of our legal and ethical obligations to make sure that individuals know that they're, maybe it's a support group. I'm thinking maybe more support group type mm -hmm. of um, space, not that, but that somebody would have to know just as if they were going out for nature therapy, that they're yeah. going outside and that they need to be aware of what, you know, we're very transparent about what, mm -hmm. what, what they'll be creating and, the space that they'll be in while that's happening and what we can ensure regarding confidentiality in those spaces. Yeah. Um, so absolutely. That's thank you for asking that. I think that's important piece of mm -hmm. technology. And then a makerspace can be as small as a desk drawer to a cart, you know, that you can wheel in and out to an actual dedicated space. It doesn't have to be. Um, yeah. But you know, in the community, it could also be in your office. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. And I don't, do you want to stick? I can come back around for stigma too, but I don't know if you. Um, no, I mean I 100% I agree, and I think that um, you know librarians or other professionals can certainly collaborate with counselors to help them create those um, those spaces in their offices, and also then collaborate if they're in the same institution in terms of using a bigger. Um, space when appropriate, when it's appropriate for the group and the goals of the group to use the bigger maker space. Librarians, as you said, very, very keen on com confidentiality and um, privacy. Um, mm -hmm. Got called radical militant librarians by the FBI <laughs> during the okay. during the Patriot Act days. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something our profession is keen on. Um, so I definitely see that. And also, um, I, I like that you brought up the idea of stigma because in some of my research, um, we've looked at the fact that librarian uh, public libraries are often seen as a stigma free place. Um, it's considered a third space by the community. People are willing to go into a library to seek out services when they may not be willing to go into other spaces because it's not it's not associated with anything that um, is stigma forming. And so a lot of um, social workers are. Definitely. collaborating with librarians and stuff too um because it, it is a space where people from all walks of life can come and feel like they are can mingle and find services and find community and um aren't aren't going for a specific thing necessarily so i think that they're um just in terms of things happening in libraries um that can that can be a positive thing so. yeah and i think also just accessibility hmm. so obviously as you know as you would with anything else, like any other type of therapy, we're thinking about our developmental ability of our clients, you know, what's appropriate. So I wouldn't bring in child scissors to work with an adult any more than I would bring in, um, you know, sharp woodworking tools to work with a small child. I, you know, we'd be mindful of being mindful of the 
client and setting same thing as beginning a new group setting what are or when I've done a lot of work with families and children you know here's my office but here are my expectations in my office you know if you take it off the shelf you have to put it back and really setting up the stage for working with the supplies ahead of time um, when you're working with depending on the population um, what I love about maker space is it's accessible to all ages right with careful thought by the counselor about what you're bringing into the space but um that adults we're seeing in pop culture, I think more and more now adults more than ever are also creating and making, whether it's making bread or, you know, building adult Lego sets have become popular or the show, like just popular television on Netflix, like making it the show or making fun or glass blowing, like all of these shows about um, creating, there's a pottery one. There's a whole bunch of different, mm -hmm. I love these, I also love these shows, but um, where we see that it's open for adults to be creative and express themselves in a way that isn't sort of thought to be, you know, yeah, I don't know if like play therapy, I know that can be done with adults, but is often thought of as working, you know, sure. with children or, um, you know, I have, in, I work with interns and I love, I mean, I love expressive arts and art interventions, and I'm very careful to help my students understand the difference between calling themselves, doing art interventions and getting a credential for art therapy, mm -hmm. um, which I encourage if they love, you know, the space, but that they they can also do art interventions yeah. as long as they're providing a space, again, that comes back to that empathic, non-judgmental oh. environment. Um, and the other thing about makerspace is that focus as well on process over product. So when we're working with client it's if something comes up that's frustrating helping them to work through what's coming up for them in the same way they all would with a problem that they might be having you know how can they transfer those skills over to um, real world problems or you know the things that are happening in their lives um so I'm sorry but it was accessible because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you're talking about and stigma because it's a global phenomenon I you know and that it's present talking about how, what would a fairly let's make a something that represents your family. Like mm. what could you create in this environment? Can you tell me about your culture through the products you're drawn to or the things you might want to use or create with? Um, so it opens a conversation in that multicultural piece. Like it's, anyone can use maker space in, in the ideology, the principles and in, you know, spirit as far as, yeah, those pieces of it. So, and that's, again, I think why there's been such a gravity towards it in, museums, libraries, like this encouragement of this space, but you being able to use the materials. Um, and this generation, I think more than any generation before, it is very comfortable with the idea of 3D printers and, you know, they're in the schools, they're in the libraries, they're in the music, like they're, they're very accessible to them. So um, did that answer? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. And <laughs> absolutely. Beautifully. Um, just because the response I'm having to it again it's just lighting up a lot so yeah well very very well put so we can incorporate this into our individual practices um uh easily like we would do sand play or it's just a new a new uh palette a new a new intervention that we can use and I, I think they're I don't know I'm feeling very lit up about this idea of incorporating the community um, as part of like maybe a treatment plan or just maybe even as a suggestion because I don't know so I'm, uh, forgive me I'm going to try to flesh this out a little bit but there's some friends I have in Brazil and they're working on uh, integrative community therapy and it's really about a community-based approach to mental mental health and mental illness and there's this very subtle shift in diagnosis from this worldview, which is that the person holding the issue, let's say addiction, um, is almost more like, a, I want to use like the word like a prophet, like they're, they're noticing something that's wrong with the community. Um, there's something in the community that's generating addiction, as opposed to an individual with an addiction. And I just, I love that a worldview, it, it's very evocative for me. And I think a theme of this conversation is knocking down barriers. And I mean, I think the essence of stigma is that there's something different than me, than the community. Like I am someone with a mental illness, so I don't belong. And until that mental illness is cured, I cannot be in the community. I think that to me is my understanding of like what stigma is. Like you're a wrong person for having this. Uh, something's wrong with you. And there's something beautiful about the spirit of a makerspace. Like everyone's welcome here. 
you know, no, you, you know, like you say, it's about process. If you're a maker, you can come here, even if you have a schizophrenia, schizophrenia diagnosis or an SUD diagnosis, like come make, and maybe it could even be celebrated. I think I also don't want to lose that spirit, you know? Um, yeah. And everyone is a maker, right? Because yeah. I think we also, when we wrote the article, a lot of what came up for us is this confusion between creativity and artistry that you yeah, yeah. are a mm -hmm. creative person, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that you are an artist, that it's okay to like baking, interior design, whatever it is that we're all creative and we all have creative abilities mm -hmm. um, that can be brought into this space. Um, and I love the idea. I, you know, it, you just reminded me too of something that I heard at a conference at one point that I love that when you have, it's similar to what you were saying about your friends in Brazil. I feel like this, if there's, if someone is struggling to learn in a classroom environment, it's not on them to work out, you know, what, what's happening with them that they're not able to. It's the school and the teachers need to figure out how to best learn. Like it's something that the system needs to fix right. to reach all learners. It's not the learner that, you know, um, gets stigmatized as having, you know, troubles in class or a troubled learner, whatever it might be. But the system needs to operate in a way that it uh, applies to all learners. And I think in counseling too, that if there's stigma surrounding right, treatment, how can we then as a community work with, you know, change and evolve mm -hmm. um, and adapt to be able to work with everybody and in these spaces and to help with that? Um, certainly voicing it and have, starting conversations surrounding it is a piece of it, but and I, I like systems. I mentioned it before, so I think it's multifaceted. That there's a lot of different ways that we're going to work through it and you know be able to support um, positive change. But that's yeah. I there's something in the spirit there that it can be used in that way too. And mm -hmm. um, I'll already call out. This is like I said. I was on sabbatical this year, and Roseanne and Dr. Perkins is on sabbatical next year. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and some of what we're going to be doing is going to schools and libraries and. Um, looking at how makerspace is used in those spaces too. Mm -hmm. Ooh, maybe we can persuade you to come down to Pittsburgh and check out some of our makerspaces. I think that's we in are my grant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, 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 good. Um, yeah, uh, so I do want to ask some other questions, but just riffing off this and curious what you think too, Dr. Perkins, is I one thing that's exciting to me about this, so you're talking about another kind of dichotomy that we're kind of breaking down a little bit is the artist and the creator, right? And I am, I like doing art interventions in my practice a lot. I really like dance. Um, but, but yeah, like there's, it's, it's a bit of, it's very vulnerable to dance, you know, and there's a lot of people, you know, I think validating our clients' concerns, like there's a lot of people on TikTok making fun of people dancing, you know, and there's a lot of in high school being made fun of dancing and, you know, in art and there we get taught who's an artist is like, that's very valid. Um, you're not, a, you're a bad artist. Like you're an athlete or you're a nerd, you know, we, these things happen and people aren't, aren't, they don't do art anymore because of this judgment, um, social judgment that happens. And we know that dance and art can be, and painting and the traditional art, expressive arts, quote unquote, traditional ones that have been used in our field are so powerful once we can overcome those blocks, but just from an effectiveness perspective, like if we can, if something novel and unique that people don't have that baggage built up on can access some of that and they don't have to deal with it, you know, and they can just like, oh, this is like a 3D printer. I've never seen something like this and I can just be liberated to create. I think it's very really exciting, you know, and we can bypass some of that uh, baggage uh, maybe. Um, I hope all of our clients can learn to express themselves, but just from an effectiveness standpoint, maybe that could be a good gateway, a very safe gateway for some of our clients. It's just a thought. I mean, have you all seen that in your research or would you agree? What do you think? Well, I think that's a lot of the philosophy behind the maker oh. maker movement is the fact that, you know, we're not, we're not naming it for expressive arts. We're not naming it for um, technology. You can, you can enter the maker space and the maker movement from a fine arts perspective or from a technology perspective or from whatever one you want to. And the idea is that once you're there, you're part of a community that has all of these things happening. And even if you're not yourself comfortable with it, or maybe you got scared off from it or discouraged from it at some point, the person next to you might be doing it. And you're looking over their shoulder and saying, oh, Ooh. that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe I could incorporate that with what I'm doing over here. And that's why so many of the maker projects that we've been playing around with 
are things like let's make a paper craft, but then light it up with LED lights, right? Well, that sounds right? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do both together. Um, and um, I think that is one way that, you know, making and maker spaces and that kind of approach allows people to be creative wherever they're comfortable with it to start, and then hopefully discover new ways that are also engaging to them, new interest and ability. And because it, it is focused on that process idea, mm. you know, play, tinker, see what happens. You know, you don't necessarily have to have something that is been done before or is expected as your as your end product. Yes. Yeah, it's intriguing. When we had students come in, I actually would like, I think the big barrier initially when they came into the makerspace, when we did it as part of a, my internship course, was just, oh, creativity, mm -hmm. right? That artistry, the myths surrounding mm -hmm. creativity, and then help giving them permission to play in the space. You have permission to be creative, like, you know, I, helping to work through what has come up for them surrounding the word creativity, even, mm -hmm. um, and offering like tinker, mm -hmm. play, explore, what comes up for you? Um, what, you know, those woodworking tools as a woman, like, was that something that you were, was a barrier for you or wasn't it? We can talk about that. Um, were there certain things that maybe, yeah, that you gravitate towards, but also what you're not gravitating towards. I mean, all of those are conversations that can be had with clients to help see what's coming up for them in the space. Um, there was something else that you mentioned now. Oh, I think also this shift in idea from left and right brain we have creative people and we have linear we have linear left brain logical we're yeah. using whole brain yeah coming together it's across mm -hmm. you know architects are not you know free they, they need the artistry of creating or designing um and then building it into what's going to be this you know more what the mechanics of go with go into it. I don't know. But so thinking through examples where we're using our entire brain and a makerspace brings together. That's why I like steam instead of STEM, but that yeah. it's bringing everything together. And I think in our profession, we can bring in some of the STEM, right? We have the art, I think, which I love. And I love that it's, we can do no tech activities all the way up, but, but that we can bring in some of the STEM pieces and cross, cross that for, for us too. Um, and I love that's, you know, part of what I get excited about when it is when the space as well. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's so, it's so true. The STEM bringing more STEM in and then just two things to just ping. I really pinged or just to reflect on um, the healing, the bringing together of things that have been separated, maybe artificially left brain, right brain, maybe a gender component too. That makes sense to me. You know, um, even I, you know, was born in the nineties. So even, you know, people constructed as men are going to be more mathematical and engineering in the STEM women can do more of the artists. It's more safe to do the um, art, art stuff. And both of us, you know, genders, no matter your gender expression, these are just capacities that we can explore and pushing back against some of that social, social conditioning, I think is going to be really interesting in our field. And I'm like super excited that y'all are bringing this forward. I want to ask this. So we're pretty much sold. I think I don't want to speak for the audience, but we're like, okay, this is like intriguing and we need to learn, at least learn more about this. So can you tell us about the research you've been doing and maybe a, a synopsis of it and like what's coming next for your research? Yeah, we have a few different things. So, like, so the first article's out, um, mm -hmm. the Journal of Creativity and Mental Health, where we yeah. um, brought the idea into an internship class, because I think there's a parallel piece of it too, where the inter my interns that year talked about how they felt empowered um, by learning about different ways that they could use creativity in their practice. Um, that's free of like needing that addition, like the, yeah, that they don't have to go on for additional credentialing, although some of them will, because it's exciting to do it if it's their passion, but others that it's okay to explore and use this creativity piece in your work. Um, and so there's this education piece, but then as they developed the activity was for them to develop an intervention they could use in practice. So something then they, their own creative piece that sort of reflects them, their interests, and because what they chose to do in the space was their own into their counseling sessions. 
Um, so they it was widely different what they chose to do. Um, you know, one student did the 3D printing, another was working with groups and they made um, mindfulness dice, like different colors. So you can see the different color and then focus on a color in the room or someone else. Another one of our female students was like, I wanted to learn how to use the woodworking tools. And she went right and learned how and she made a Jenga board with the woodworking blocks and brought that into her session. Um, so what they chose to do was personal and expression of themselves in addition to the bringing it in and then talking about how it worked with their clients um, or what they thought would be most helpful. Someone else created a puppet. I'm trying to remember all of their activities, but um, so we did a workshop following up on that. We did a workshop, um, which we've written up and we hope to have published, mm -hmm. uh, but it's all written up and out there via review uh, where we did, um, we're calling it maker therapy. So the idea and it's oh. defined as integrating makerspace ideology and interventions into practice for clinical outcomes. So bringing those that not only the, yeah, the interventions, but the ideology with it as well um, into counseling. So crossing that in. So that article, we, we developed a workshop around it um, and talked about it and then had students practice with different types of activities um, and then got their feedback and, and wrote that up. Mm -hmm. um, and that permission to be creative is one of the pieces that really came from that study too. Like you let like, oh, once, once I was told it was okay to be playful, to be creative, then I could go for it. Mm -hmm. um, but until then they, it was a feeling like that wasn't something they could do. Um, yeah. So that, then we're also writing a book um, so that looking at introducing it, um, I'll, I'll talk more in depth, talking about a lot of things we've talked about with you today. Um, and then walking through what it might look like with a group, what it might look like in schools, what it might look like with families, um, based on what's already out there, because we already have so much out there. We're not, again, it's not a reinvention of what we've already been doing, but what theories, you know, can be brought in. So if you're doing narrative, how can we tell stories with some of this technology, right? Um, if you're doing mindfulness, how can we use some of this and be mindful while we're creating? Like, how can we bring some of those practices do it. If it's, um, yeah, thinking about um, being in the here and now, if you're doing gestalt, like really being, again, that's sort of that mindfulness, but being present and bringing your whole body into it. Like what's coming up for you as you're working on this or when, when you felt like maybe something didn't go well, if your light didn't light up, um, you know, how can we sort of come back and problem solve that, which is okay because we're celebrating that it didn't light up and thinking about how to come back and revisit it, you know, certainly for CBT, just attention, focus, um, if you're working with, you know, uh, behavioral things that you're trying to work through. Um, and I would say to students too, you would never tell a client, sorry, you don't know how to solve your problem. I guess you're not creative. I'll see you later. <laughs> no, we creatively help facilitate an environment to problem solve with them. And you're doing the same thing. You're just, but sometimes it feels less um, intimidating to, to work on a project together and work through those things versus, you know, um, be having the words for it. Trauma, you know, so much of that is stored and it's pre-verbal um, in our bodies. So how can we express what's happening in another way in that space? Um, again, not re but combining it with what we already are doing, um, yeah. and bringing that empathy, non-judgment, like those pieces into the space as well. So mm. that we're already doing as counselors. Yeah. So, so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess I want to ask, well, I just, I keep doing reflections because, um, just so, uh, uh, I'm forgetting my role as interviewer and like, uh, it, it's been more dialogue, but I think that's good too. Um, but it's just like this thing about the ideology, I think is really, really intriguing to me, especially this is more counseling centric, but you know, one of the um, ethical dilemmas that can come up around like diagnosis and assessment is the balance between, oh, this is good. We have a strategy and a path forward, but then like the failure mode of that sometimes is stigma and being in a box and being constrained by a diagnosis. And, you know, maybe even saying, well, now that I'm this diagnosis, I have less agency, et cetera, et cetera. And there's something about the ideology of makerspace that I really like, because you can kind of almost transform that phenomenon into something creative. It's like, okay, you know, what can I create from this limitation I have? Um, or, and so I think it balances both the need we have for clarity and then the 
potential of flexibility and change. And it kind of brings both of those together because it's very real and material. You know, makerspace is like, we're going to make this an object and like <laughs> play with it, you know, which is so it's very real. Uh, and like you're talking about, it's like it can represent you or potentially even your diagnosis or something or a uh, memory or, you know, a relationship with a family member that's difficult or good. Um, but then it's also malleable. So I just think that's really intriguing. Um, and so, okay, so like I said, we're convinced, the audience is convinced we're going to check out the book and we're uh, when it's out and we're going to check out the the article. I'm curious about the process. Like, how did this happen? Like, I'm so you've done research that is making a novel contribution to the field. Like, what goes into that? You know, I'm curious for folks who maybe don't have scholarship and research as part of their professional identity or folks that do that want to just connect with you. Like, what was it like to to discover this? Uh, it's an open question, but just whatever comes up for either of you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Perkins. Sure. Um, <laughs> well, we both kind of came, um, started our journeys at KU on sort of similar timelines. And so we were in a lot of um, meetings together and our, our, one of our previous deans was really kind of talking about how collaborating is good. <laughs> right. And we were already friends and um, we were in these meetings together and we were kind of like, how could we collaborate? Like, what are the things that, what are the interests that we already know we have in common? What are the philosophies that we already know that we have in common that we can kind of channel towards doing some original research or something that isn't being done with that eye towards, you know, um, collaborating across disciplines? Because we were in the same college, but we're in different disciplines. Um, and we chatted through a couple of different things. And I think I had been doing some makerspace things through my art education background. Mm. And I just kind of brought it up. And it was something that Deb was instantly like, I like that stuff. <laughs> I have my, my uh, prior to counseling, I came via a career in as a teacher and working with children oh. with learning language, behavioral, emotional disabilities. So thinking outside the box is something I love mm -hmm. um, and trying to do and, and um, was familiar with makerspace, but was in, was teaching the class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, it was just conversations and shared, shared philosophy, not, but coming from two different disciplinary perspectives. Right. So again, this idea of like taking some of those down, they're artificial, right. And, and working across them, um, you know, and it just kind of grew from there, I think. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. <laughs> okay. Um, and that it wasn't once we started talking about it, there's so many ways to work across disciplines and to work collaboratively. Um, and so this was one that really came together really nicely, but that for anyone else who's looking to do that, yeah, see who you're, who are you friendly with at the university that are in other departments? What are some of the crossovers and links there um, that can help us to, to make some of these con connections? Um, and there's so many I mean, we're just, it's exciting to think about what our, you know, research path line is going to be moving forward. We have, we're going to work, do some more with the community support piece in schools mm -hmm. um, moving forward as well. And so really thinking about, you know, all, there's so many different ways to collaborate across. So I think that's, yeah, because our next our next focus is going to be going into some schools to see what's happening in them, because schools are a place where we already have librarians, we already have counselors, and we already have makerspaces a lot of times. How are these three things working together, or are they not, <laughs> right? Does the counselor know that they can go into the mm -hmm. makerspace and use that space for their, their work with their students, right? Does the librarian think to reach out to the counselor as a potential collaborator? Do they realize they can go together to advocate for um, you know, the use of the space and more resources for the space because it meets both of their goals as professionals? Um, and so you know, we're going to be laying the groundwork for you know, how can those collaborations maybe start happening a little bit more solidly in K-12 schools? And then, of course, you know, hopefully that carries out to other locations too. <laughs> and those community spaces yeah. that you were just, you know, you just, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully into individual offices, knowing that it only needs to be a drawer. You know, like I, like I said, I have a small, we have a 3D printer at home um, and I have, you know, a nine and an 11 year old and my nine year old's doing something at school right now where he's creating a board game and he's home, he's making a dragon, he made a wizard, he's bringing all his little pieces into school, like, but it's just really exciting to watch what he, and it's, he was using that 3D printer as a seven-year-old though. Mm -hmm. It was not, there's applications out there today that it's very, 
user friendly at any age level. And then you can all the way up to using like um, software for college students or adults like Tinkercad and things. But but that it's, you know, that the at any age level, it's accessible. So it's and they don't have to be used discreetly or independent of other things. So like one of the projects that I worked on with my undergrads this year, um, they iterated a script using AI to figure out how that tool works and created a script. And then they made all of their props and their <laughs> scenery using our campus makerspace. And then they put on the play and either recorded it or did it live. Ooh. And so they're using all of these different tools to put together into one end product, right? Instead of just focusing on discreetly, like let's 3D print something or let's sew something. They're they're coming at it from a whole- That's whole a good point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So integrating that into whether we're educators or counselors, there's a kind of a direction that we have and how can these tools support that direction? Um, yeah, and be, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, just to reflect a little bit on the research Thing. So y'all kind of naturally had an affinity of uh, vibes, as they say, a good vibe. We're like Hoobian. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And then it's nice. I mean, maybe just encouraging some of our doc students, even our master's students and people professionally working as uh, counselors. And then, of course, faculty. Um, this is a nice way to deepen your relationship with someone you get along with. Like, hey, let's try out a conference presentation or some research um, and give it a shot. And it's a way to kind of deepen an existing relationship. Um, and develop some uh, deeper professional relationships and and develop develop ourselves. Um, and it's really, really fun. And then it also benefits the field because um, we need your voice um, big time because we have a lot of problems we're solve, trying to solve. And then two, um, maybe we can be brave if we're particularly interested in makerspaces, like doing some networking and connecting uh, with community spaces that maybe have these and creating some connections. Yeah, there are so many spaces out there. Once you start looking, like once I, I'm in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and I'll be walking, Doylestown has a Makers on Main, Makers off Main. They're like, mm -hmm. they have a chain. They have two different locations. <laughs> they have the Fab Lab. Um, the Fab Lab comes to schools. They have a mobile maker car that comes to the schools, but they also offer camps and things, and you can connect with those spaces. Um, there is, I mean, there's so many, but, but that aside, I'm just, some of the volunteer work I do and just offering to, to you know, collaging. Mm. Has been, but digital collaging or, you know, the like Procreate is one of the, an app that, you know, like just for creating and designing again, things we're, we've been doing, just adding this additional piece to it, but then just doing that in the space and asking what I, I I'm lucky to be at, I think a university where I'm allowed to create classes <laughs> um, for electives, you know, like I, we're k -Crip, So obviously I'm not, you know, but bringing it into elective world. Um, but I developed a creativity class that I taught for the first time last summer. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. working with students and we had someone come in and we did collaging. So just collaging their joyful moments, collaging, and, and then offering a circle where we can talk about that. And that's something that can be done in the community, you know, with as long as, you know, we're certainly being mindful to call it either support or, mm -hmm. but, but that we could bring some of those workshops Right, into the community and um, being transparent about what we're offering and who we are. And it's not therapy in that case, it's, you know, a workshop or a support, yeah. but that um, just to help with some, or, or doing it with a group, right, in therapy or in counseling. So, yeah. yeah. And I know professionally, one of the cool things that we've experienced is yeah. being able to attend conferences that aren't in our discipline. So I went with Deb to a counseling <laughs> conference. She came with me to an instructional technology conference where we presented. And then we're going to present at a school library conference this spring. And like we get to move across our disciplines, even in terms of the networks that we're building um, with other professionals, which is really cool too. And the librarian conference this spring oh, is at Kalahari. <laughs> I heard the school Just librarian. ACA shouting out. But <laughs> yeah, I heard the school librarian conferences are pretty fun. So that's a, yeah. <laughs> that's a, a good excuse to get into uh, collaborating with. Um, awesome scholars um, yeah. across disciplines. I want to like get really practical. So on the research, so we're talking about some of the big the strategies and the collaboration and the values around it. But what's it like? You're writing a book, right? So like writing habits, collaboration. Like how do you brainstorm? What's it like? How do you, yeah, work together on like an interesting um, project like this? Do you have any? Do you want to describe what your processes are and then maybe any tips you have for folks who want to uh, try to step into that kind of world? 
Yeah. Finding a writing partner that you enjoy working with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and sometimes it takes a project to realize if this is like the, a person that I enjoy working with or not, or is on the same page in, in writing, or at least having a good rapport mm-hmm. is really important for a writing project of any type, book, article, research, what, what, what have you. Um, so I think for me, it has felt simpler to kind of want to meet weekly. Yeah. You know, and we meet and we meet either at a Panera or we meet on campus and we brainstorm together, talk about what we're excited about. We usually start by talking about Mm -hmm. whatever TV shows we're watching, (laughs) what our kids are up to, but then Mm -hmm. moving into talking about, Hey, this came up for me, or I'm really struggling with this idea. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. Um, or, Hey, can we split the work up this way? I'm going to work on this. And you're and just that transparency is really important. Mm -hmm. Being able to, identify right from the start, like, hey, in this chapter, you know, Roseanne has said, hey, this is a counseling piece that I'm not going to feel comfortable writing. Mm-hmm. And then there are times when I'm like, hey, this is makerspace in the news. This is definitely not, this is more, you probably have this already. Mm-hmm. And just really being able to divide it out at the front end and working on a book. This is the first book that I've, I've written chapters, but I've never um, worked on an entire book before. So having this be the first book, start to finish, um, that each chapter is its own article and Mm -hmm. it's you know really working through the literature and the resource and the history of it um and seeing what what are our strengths at the front end of it even though the chapter evolves as we're writing it anyway because hey i found a whole bunch of articles on this and i think maybe we should include this in a chapter Mm -hmm. Um, or we didn't have it initially mapped out but let's put it in um so just that transparency and the relationship i feel like need to be and and just the reality of what it is to kind of put it all together and get it out. Yeah. We give each other assignments and deadlines. Like we agree. Okay. You're going to take this part. I'm going to take this part. We're going to get back together on this date. And then sometimes we're like, well, that date kind of went by, but that's okay. We're going <laughs> we're gonna to keep going. Um, and I'm um, trading it back and forth then, you know, so I'll work on a piece and she'll work on a piece. And then we kind of trade and we see where we're at. And yeah, you know, we we focus on the things that the expertise that we each individually bring. And then, um, you know, the other one kind of is the critical friend who takes a look and says, oh, OK, <laughs> maybe this needs a little more go. That's really cool. I like how you said that. And then, you know, we just we it becomes more cohesive as we as we trade it back and forth then over time. So. And what our strengths are, if we need to bring in an extra mm-hmm. person, like when either one of us, well, that's not true. I, I'll just speak for myself. I am not as comfortable working out the methodology for something quantitative. And so, and Rosanna may be more comfortable doing that actually than I am. Um, but if we needed to bring in another voice, like what do we, you know, that we're comfortable. Mm-hmm. So in the spirit of collaboration, I think. Um, that it's about bringing together something that we're excited about that follows our energy um, so that it feels enjoyable to be on and that we want it to be successful. So that's a big piece of it as well, I think. But yeah, so I'm hearing, yeah, some of the themes from earlier too, just strong collaboration and that helps with like accountability and just having commitment. Uh, It's really easy. I think a lot of us coming out of like dissertation world, it's like that's such an individual journey. And then like having a collaborative partner, it's easy to like show up. It's easier for me. I'll speak for myself to really show up for a, a colleague and stay committed. And that's really, and we can pick each other up when I'm having a bad couple of weeks can, can we can, uh, our cycles can start overlapping a little bit and, um, yeah, it just makes, uh, things m- move more, uh, smoothly. And then probably there's fluidity and, um, just having those regular check-ins, the right kind of practices and routines emerge, um, just by having that kind of ritualistic meeting. Um, so I hope people will try it. Let us know if y'all, um, we want to hear from, uh, talking to the audience now, we want to hear what you're researching and your ideas, um, um, okay, what else did I want? to, Oh, I did. Maybe we could shift gears a little bit if it's all right in the last uh, portion. Um, I like to talk a little bit about development, so like growth and development across careers uh, uh, during your career. And I'm curious, like, have there uh, been for either of you like people you came across, like mentors, people in the field, the collective fields that uh, we should know about and we should uh, that you want to celebrate and. Um, that our audience maybe should read or um, learn about. Um, so mentors, um, whether they're 
in research or published authors or just people in your life too we like to hear about ancestry and that kind of stuff too um so mentors that's the question who have your mentors been yeah um i have a lot mm -hmm. of mentors i learned from probably everyone that i've ever contacted with mm -hmm. i know i have learned from um but mentors in the counseling field maybe to start i would say um probably the, fa the faculty at Kent State where I did my doctoral program, um, Cassandra Storley is absolutely one of my mentors, um, that her work ethic, being mindful of doing quality research, um, leadership in the field, service. And I learned that from all the professors there. I'm thinking of Cassandra Storley, but certainly Marty Gensius, John West, who's now retired, but was on my dissertation committee, Cynthia Osborne, who's also on my dissertation committee. I'm just individuals who really taught me how to be humble in my writing and to take feedback, to work through it, um, that it's important as a professional, not only to be a counselor, but to be a leader and to servant leader. Um, some of those pieces that have really stayed with me about you know, the counselor educator I want to be, the researcher I want to be, and then the professional and human, I hope that I am. <laughs> um, so I think those mentors in my master's program, I did participatory action research with um, uh, Laura Smith, Dr. Laura Smith at Teachers College at Columbia, and she was phenomenal. Um, and just learning about action research and really coming in at the grassroots level and seeing what's important to, to individuals not to come in and say, this is my research and here's what I think should happen here, but what would be important to you? And then being co-collaborators and equals at the table um, mm -hmm. with a population, you know, with your um, you know, individuals. So I think definitely those names come out. I mean, you said I could do non-professional. So, so, I mean, my family is, I'm always watching um, and love just being with them. And I learned so much um, about you know, my work, <laughs> but, 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 but just from them and the way that they take to things and love things and just their energy is always helps me ground me in my own work and life. So <laughs> sure if all that came out coherently, <laughs> um, but certainly those individuals as well. And then maybe people I haven't met, think like Sam Gladding, um, interpersonal neurobiology. We didn't talk about a lot about neuroscience, but it's another passion of mine. Um, Chad Luke, um, who's also been a wonderful mentor and I've written with, um, just always being excited about following energy and, and what's exciting coming up for you. Um, although I, I have written with him, so I do know him, but Sam Gladding, I never had the fortune to meet, um, although I did see sit in some of his sessions and the work that he's done with creativity and counseling. You know, Natalie Rogers and expressive arts therapy, some of those um, individuals out there that were role models, I think, in the field, you know, in their work, so. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, my group is, so I have to start with the librarians and I have to give a shout out to anybody. If you haven't reached out to the librarians in your community, definitely do that. They're wonderful collaborators. They don't always think to promote themselves that way. So if you, but you go find them, I can almost guarantee you're gonna find a, a partner who's going to, to wanna work with you. And my first mentor in that capacity was my mother, <laughs> who was also a librarian, oh. <laughs> friends in our family. My cool. mom's a librarian, my husband's a librarian, my brother's a librarian. It's a little contagious, so watch <laughs> out. Um, but beyond my my library circles, um, I would say uh, obviously my, um, my academic advisor through my dissertation process really taught me to be a researcher and a critical look at things through a critical lens. And that's Dr. Brooke Sawyer at Lehigh University. So um, she's from the instructional technology um, ed psych side of the side of the world. But again, cross disciplinary jumped right in with me with my library stuff and was happy to do it. Um, so that's fantastic. And here at KU, Dr. Um, Amy Wonder, Amy Filer Wonder in the art education program was one of the first people to do cross-disciplinary research with me where we brought librarians and art educators together, which I thought was really a cool approach. Because again, you have, often have art teachers and librarians in the same building not thinking to collaborate. <laughs> so that was um, that was something that was really cool to do with her. Um, yeah, and you know, yeah, family, friends. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Who. Dr. Who. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dr. Doctor. Who. <laughs> mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I just really appreciate it. It's somewhat selfishly because I just am always looking to add to my reading list and add uh, interesting guests, um, but also just to kind of contextualize 
um, the work people are doing is just fascinating. And then also it just always fills me with gratitude. I think we were talking maybe in the pre-interview, just people like you, people are willing to give back and, and um, it's service, you know, service. A lot of, some of our structures don't always incentivize mentorship. Um, and sometimes, you know, it can even be smarter to focus on other professional ambitious goals and people who really dedicate them to helping helping other people, it just really uh, fills my heart. And so I like to give uh, people a platform to to celebrate people who do that. Um, so thank you for indulging me that in that. Um, so we're coming. Thank you for, thank you for yeah. offering the platform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I just have to, did you say you're on the other side of dissertation? Does that mean you are? Oh, no, 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 not yet. Oh, okay. no, no, it's no. a test of perseverance more than anything else. <laughs> test of your... <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've got a lot of, in our audience, we've got a lot of, um, a recent dot just because where I'm at developmentally, um, people kind of cl close to that or finish just finishing, okay. um, starting their career as counselor educator. So I was more so talking to them. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll keep it perseverance is imp important. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. And um, also moments of uh, re renewal, you know, when something's a grind, you know, having a nice conversation like this or just getting fired up again. It, doing that, trying to do that regularly or going out into the community, into a library. Um, yeah, and definitely uh, the library community, I'm definitely going to be reaching out to folks at IUP and uh, in Pittsburgh. We've got a good library system in Pittsburgh. Um, and they're really awesome. Um, they have great um, makerspaces in some of their public libraries in Pittsburgh already, yeah. yeah. Probably, I bet you have a, you might have a makerspace on campus. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to look into that. I'm actually not sure. And yeah, I just want to give a shout. I mean, we, we're dealing a lot in Pittsburgh right now. This is a bit of a tangent with, I mean, just a really cr crisis in housing. Um, and just the unhoused population is really increasing. And it's been really cold in the li libraries of, you know, like you said, I don't think there's not third places have dwindled uh, where you can go to the bathroom and not pay any money you know how many are there in a city like pittsburgh i can't really think of any outside of libraries to be honest um that aren't shelters um so maybe churches sometimes but even so that's dwindling um so anyways yeah so big shout out to all of our librarian friends um both scholars and um in the field um but i'm, I'm curious what didn't we touch on is there anything i didn't ask that feels important to center um, kind of as we're approaching the end of the interview, I'm curious if there's uh, any kind of final final thoughts or things I didn't think to to ask that's on either of your minds. Oh, good question. Not specifically, just to encourage people to get their hands on things and try it. Don't be intimidated. Don't be scared to try it. Most people are happy amateurs, you know, <laughs> um, but you never know what you're going to discover that, that you're good at um, or enjoy and just, you know, what it's good at mean and what, what's going to bring you happiness, what's going to bring you um, fulfillment. And you, it may be a, sitting in a library or in a school or in a um, counselor office <laughs> waiting for you. So you just got to try it out. Yeah. There's so, I think my takeaway, like I'll, I, we know we've said it already is just that counselors are creative problem solvers. Mm -hmm. right? Again, you would never say to a client, yeah, it sounds like I'm stumped. See you later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not, not what we're bringing into the session. We're offering a space to process. Tell me more about this. Like we're helping you know, our clients and empowering them to, or facilitating an environment for creative problem solving for them to think of things they haven't tried yet, right? Um, and so there's a lot of overlap there. And so just to, for those who feel like they don't, haven't looked at creative interventions or creativity in counseling because they are, had written off creativity as something that's not in my realm, just to maybe this is a call to come back and revisit how they are bringing it into session, even if it's your you know talk therapy, but it's they're bringing it into session, um, so that there's yeah that creates just yeah maybe just bringing that back. I'd like to re-echo that at the end that mm -hmm. we're all creative, and yeah, and just this process, this pro you know the creative process and trying to hold that's a big theme for me, like trying to bracket the outcome. Um, and allow people to step into that authenticity 
um, something I'll definitely be working on. And I'll come into this. I have had this idea since you were talking about 3D printing. I have a really active dream life and I work in counseling a lot with my dreams. And I like want to print the recurring characters out. Like I have these recurring characters and I think it would be really fun to make them. Um, yeah. Just have them on my desk. Yeah. It's there's so many applications for it that we are already like for things like using Santray and printing their own yeah. favorites, play, play genograms, um, you know, where there's, and the it's, ones, it's yeah. buying all the figurines, it's getting yeah. the figurine and the filament, mm -hmm. but letting them create them or make them or using a stock images, but printing them. Yeah. Um, and until you, I would say also to Google 3D printing so you can see it in action. It's really cool to watch. Mm -hmm. And many individuals might be going, I don't really get what a 3D, like, there's still that sort of sense of like, what is a 3D printer and how does it work? And um, just even watching it is fun to like see this figurine come to life mm -hmm. or product or project that you're working on. And it's tangible and you can keep it then. Like you can keep your figurine. Like you yeah. said, like, something of mine from my dream that's brought to life that I can keep with me to look at and see how it changes or evolves over time or just for inspiration or what have you, what the goal is, but um, that there's so many pieces just with the 3D printer, never mind everything else, but the 3D printer, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating, so cool. Okay, um, so yeah, y'all have both been so generous with your time, so grateful, uh, we're so excited. I'll be posting in our show notes the article and um, another last final question is, how can we help you and support your, your work and your research and your ideas? Um. Mm -hmm. come and say hi to us at conferences and um, reach out if there's anything we've talked about. I think that, you know, it's exciting to you. Um, we're always with spirit of <laughs> um, collaborating or just, you know, as a resource in your own, in your own work. Um, certainly when the book comes out, check it out, mm -hmm. but you know, not, not to be a pitch for that. Mm -hmm. still, what are we hoping for December? I right? think <laughs> that maybe Ooh, December. Yeah. Um, we'll send you a link when it's out. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe next year we can have you on again and we'll uh, review it. Um, that'd be great. And I'll do a quick self-promotional thing. Dr. Duenius is keynoting the IUP Social Justice Conference uh, coming up in March. So uh, this is, should be for the first uh, 50 thousand people who listen to this i'm just kidding for the first uh folks who listen to this you will still have a chance to register so uh come check out uh her talk there we're really yeah, i might even have there. an activity or two Ooh, for you to no. do there so <laughs> yes yes so um yeah i just want to thank you both so much and um i want to thank the audience too and we'll see you next time bye everyone thank, thank you, you.